Thank you very much. So I will uh, share my screen, but I just wanted to say a very strong uh, namaskar, namaste to you all, and thank you very much. So start here with my own title slide, but um, in, in the time period that I submitted my uh, biography, I was promoted to associate professor. So um, the university has deemed it because of my research goals and uh, the number of students I have to uh, promote me to associate professor. So I'm very grateful for that. So thank you. And uh, I'm with the Department of Anthropology. We're in the School of Global Integrative Studies at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. So um, it is starting to get cold and um, uh, Mr. Barry Fisher, I'll let you know that uh, it's even a little bit later here than where you are. So um, um, it's almost uh, 1130 p.m. So on Friday night. So but uh, I'm always grateful to have the opportunity to talk about um, aspects of forensic archaeology and the use of this for outdoor crime scene investigation. What I wanted to basically because uh, a lot of times that I when I'm talking to crime scene investigators, they don't really understand uh, sort of, I mean, they work with a lot of forensic anthropologists and forensic odontologists, but I also wanna give a broader perspective on what uh, anthropology is in general. So it's the study of humanity in all of its aspects. And so we break it down usually into four fields of archeology, span which is what we'll be talking about today physical and biological anthropology, which is the core of forensic anthropology, uh, cultural or social anthropology, and oftentimes linguistics as well. So archeology span is the interpretation of humanity's past from surviving material culture. So the things that we find, objects. And so this is why um, what I want you to start thinking about is crime scene investigation is trying to recreate the activities that happened in the past, but happened um, in the very recent past. But archeology span most of the time is talking about things that happened in the very ancient past um, from maybe a few decades to uh, several thousand years ago. And so physical or biological anthropology is a structure of the study physiology and evolution of the human organism and its ancestral forms. And this is where forensic anthropology is an identification process using skeletal remains or decomposing remains to try to understand who this individual is and perhaps also contribute to an understanding of how they may have died. Cultural or social anthropology is the study at of the social and cultural systems developed by humans during their daily interactions with each other. And then linguistics, it's a study of the languages, vocal and non-vocal used by humans or other higher primates to communicate. So forensic anthropology, as I said earlier, is the use of the methods of physical or biological anthropology, as well as archeology span applied in a medical legal setting. Some of the things that, that you've been talking about and that uh, we'll be talking about for the next uh, two days in dealing with crime scene investigation. So in this address, um, I'll be concentrating on the use of archeology span to understand and interpret scenes of crimes and mass disasters. So I wanted to emphasize, and I, I don't wanna say that the criminal site scene or crime scene investigators um, are not doing a good job because of uh, they don't, they're not archeologists. But what I'm saying is that um, for crime scenes in the inside, on the, in an interior, uh, like a room or a home or a business, on the inside, the crime scene investigators are top notch in, in most um, uh, jurisdictions. And so I don't wanna say that they're not doing their job, but archeologists are exceptional in the experience that we have in understanding the processes of change and deposition of evidence in outdoor settings. So this includes um, geological changes, uh, decompositional changes, the modification of the evidence in an outdoor setting, because this is the primary areas in which we are excavating. We're in the outdoors. And so we're excavating sometimes very small scale, sometimes very large scale, but it's always in an outdoor setting. And there's certain kinds of things that happen to evidence uh, in an outdoor setting, dealing with changes, 
exposure to the elements uh, and deposition in, an, in the environment through uh, different activities of how things get buried. So as an example, this is uh, one of the excavations that I took uh, place in uh, Harappa in Pakistan. And so uh, I'm working with some of uh, our local people that were there and mapping material that is dates to about 2600 um, BCE or about 40, 4,600 years ago. And so these are the kinds of techniques that we have to understand, how did this material get buried? How did it get modified? And so a lot of this is to reconstruct activities that happened you know, over 4,000 years ago with the, the Sarasvati uh, culture. But those kinds of ideas and the way of thinking and the way of looking at evidence can also allow us to interpret and reconstruct the activities of what happened, even at a crime scene that may be just a few hours old. It might be some of the cold cases that I worked on for the US Department of Defense or airplane crashes from World War II that were in, um, you know, 60, 70, 80 years old. So very cold cases in that term of a sense to recover and identify the, the remains of the, of the air crew or people that were buried in battlefields uh, several decades earlier. And I just wanted to show this, this is an example of some of the cultural anthropology. So I've, I've sort of done a lot of uh, little things. And so this is an example of some of the uh, work that I did with some of the local fisher folk. I've been working in Oman as well as uh, off the, uh, uh, the Makran coast of, of Pakistan. And I've actually extended this into areas in Gujarat, India. So this is, this is a much younger me about 30 years ago uh, doing this work and living in a small fishing village uh, outside of Karachi. So what is forensic anthropology to begin with? I mean, I keep throwing that word out and saying it's related to uh, biological anthropology, but in it, we have five main objectives. So we wanna develop a biological profile and I'll get to that, what that is in a moment. We wanna look at perimortem trauma or the trauma that occurred at uh, or around the time of death. Um, determine the post-mortem interval. This is an important aspect of how long has this person been dead? I mean, I think that's one of the first questions I get from our local law enforcement here in Nebraska is how long has this person been dead? Um, is it a forensic context or is it archeological? Many of the materials that I look at are either animal bones or they're uh, native indigenous peoples um, so that they really have no forensic context. Uh, so they're not of forensic interest. And as well as trying to establish the uh, personal identification of the individual. So the biological profile is what we want to establish to begin the identification process to compare to a missing persons report or a personnel file uh, or any recollections by relatives. So how old was this person? What was their biological sex? What was their geographic origin or ancestry? Where did they come from? And how did that affect how they looked? And also their stature, how tall was this individual? Other aspects that we want to do is to contribute to an understanding of how did this person die? So we can an analyze um, different forms of trauma, like the individual on your right, uh, blunt force trauma and the individual on the left um, had a form of trauma, but he was also um, in a, um, this actually is at the bottom of up here. So these are, are pallets on the, on the left side of the individual, but he was encased in, or he was in water for quite a while before he was found. So, and then it was drained so that we could recover the body. But it's very intact, as you can see. Some of the bones have moved around out of place, particularly with the vertebral column, but he's relatively uh, intact. So we, we the information of this at the end the individual, any dense things like that to begin to construct who comparison with the personnel files and any missing persons report. So to get the, the crux of what I'm talking about is 
in dealing with forensic archaeology. So what we want to do is to understand the formation of the assemblages or the criminal materials that we're finding or the evidence. This assemblage is a biological and or material evidence that's created by criminal activity within a broader setting of the landscape, both internal and external. But like I said, primarily the archaeologists are really focused on looking at the external environment. We want to recover and record the materials uh, as well as the biological evidence in a manner that preserves the integrity of the spatial and temporal context of the scene. And so what does that mean? We want to be able to under, re, reconstruct, and a lot of this is done now through GIS uh, with a lot of portable apps and a lot of portable uh, mapping software. Um, but as you saw in that photograph, we were doing things by hand and that was about 15 years ago. Um, and as academics, a lot of times we can't afford the, the best data or the best data collection systems, uh, although we're getting there. But we want to be able to record the evidence. So basically, we can reconstruct the, the crime scene, including of where all the objects were found in relation to each other back on a computer in the lab. So we want to make sure that we record all that information, even if it's just um, written documentation on paper. And so that is the spatial aspect, but as things get buried, sometimes that has to deal with the temporal context. When did that happen? When was this body put there? When was it buried? Maybe it had been exhumed and put somewhere else. And so we can begin to reconstruct different activities that occurred at different times at the context of the scene. So that's what's an, another aspect that archeologists are very good at thinking about. Uh, this is another example from uh, excavations at Harappa. And so that you can see that the excavations uh, where the individual is sitting on the top, uh, as we dig down, we dig down in through time. And so we're digging uh, deeper and deeper. And each one of those layers um, is earlier than the one above it. And so this gives you an idea about some of the things I'm talking about is that we can reconstruct by understanding the uh, spatial organization, but we can also reconstruct how things occurred in time. So what kinds of sites are we looking at that we can find? Move this over a little bit. So we've got surface scatters of remains that are never have never been buried. We've got burial sites of persons that were deliberately buried or incorporated naturally into the environment after falling where they were killed or buried uh, in terms of clandestine or hidden activities. And these may include mass graves as well. And then mass disasters, which would include things like aircraft crash sites, mass fatalities like in tsunamis, and mass suicides like occurred at Jonestown, Guyana. And so you can see some of the examples. This skeleton was an individual that was killed uh, by the local um, militia during a junta in uh, Colombia. And so this is a local villager. And so we were um, going in to excavate this individual and get out as quickly as possible because we only had uh, permission from the local um, militia to be there for um, just a very short period of time, including the travel time there. And then the other is uh, the other photograph is an aircraft crash site uh, in Papua New Guinea that I worked on. So just to give a quick overview, um, one of the things that we want to do, and th these are pretty much standard aspects of any crime scene, we wanna protect the scene to prevent unauthorized disturbance by people or even natural events. This is something that we need to think about. We want to record and recover the evidence and try to reconstruct this three-dimensional spatial framework. Um, what are the X, Y, and Z coordinates of each uh, piece of evidence? And we want to do a preservation and immediate curation of that evidence if warranted. So we want to, um, so that it doesn't get damaged from the time of recovery to transportation and eventual analysis in our laboratories. This just gives you an example. This is a training site out near um, the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, which we buried plastic skeletons. Um, and we train the local police department to excavate these clandestine graves. And one of the first things they begin to do is to notice um, aspects of disturbed ground, um, uh, 
and um, reburial of material. And so over time, as we excavate and put these back uh, together, so I haven't excavated this one for two years, um, it's a little more difficult to find. I know exactly where it is, but it's a really good exercise for the uh, police because this area now is overgrown with grass again. Uh, the um, sod has been replaced. Uh, and has been regrown. And so it's a little more difficult to find. So it creates a more realistic setting for training purposes. And this is the area we we're using drones to uh, record some of the evidence. And so we had two burials out in this area and you can see where it had been cleared. And you can see as we zoom in with the drones, we begin to get uh, a better picture about what was going on here after the excavation of the burial. And so we have uh, these uh, one meter squares over the burial and then it was excavated and mapped by the drones. And so this is really good uh, evidence for um, in a court setting because it puts it in a regional context or, or an aerial context and it zooms in on the grave itself. Other aspects of training that we do here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln is um, not just uh, terrestrial archeology span and crime scene, but we do uh, forensic work in, uh, in the lakes and rivers. And so I've started training uh, students and law enforcement to do underwater forensic investigations. So this includes basically teaching them different search techniques, but initially I have to teach them the baseline uh, scuba diving techniques, and then we begin to do with evidence mapping and uh, recovery. And so here are the students I have found and are recovering a mannequin uh, in a specialized underwater uh, body bag so that um, it doesn't contain as much water because uh, fresh water weighs about, uh, I won't convert this into kilograms, but it's about 62 pounds per square foot. So if the bag is full of water as well as the body, it's very difficult. So we try to put it in a mesh bag that even, but it's the fine mesh so that the water will drain out, but um, most evidence will be uh, preserved. But it also allows us to uh, take samples of materials that we need to underwater. Evidence curation is extremely important, as many of you know already, is that we wanna provide an appropriate chain of custody or chain of evidence documents, uh, reports, and any other related documentation, such as the photography as well, the imagery. We wanna be able to present our findings and reports or present them in court in a way that also requires um, um, specific kinds of training so that students and professionals are, are uh, able to easily present those in a court setting, which can be very nervous uh, for people. And then we also want to understand that we want to conduct our activities in an ethical manner and treat particularly with human remains and treat them in an ethical manner, even during an analysis stage. It's very clinical, but we also want to understand that these are, are people and have families and we want to be able to understand that aspect of that as we continue to work with the remains to make sure that they are given uh, go back to their families for disposition. This is just an example. Some of these, uh, I know that many of you are already familiar with, but these are um, where it says DPAA COC sample form. This is the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency, the U.S. Department of Defense's uh, unit that it recovers the remains of missing in action personnel from different wars from World War II, Korea, the Vietnam conflict, and then later wars uh, that we go in and the chain of custody sample form. So this is the sample form of what we use for chain of custody, as well as the bagging of the evidence. So how do we achieve these goals? If, if the goals are to reconstruct and do a three-dimensional uh, analysis of, the material, of these materials, what are the goals of forensic archeology? span So we wanna survey and uh, analyze the topographic landscape. So we wanna understand what the landscape looks like that we're in. We wanna recognize and confirm that the area is a contemporary crime scene. And, uh, we want to determine uh, the scene's dimensions and perimeters. We want to make sure that we understand the size and distribution of the evidence within the crime scene. 
And also like we, I showed in those photographs, and we wanna recognize disturbed soil. I apologize for the train in the background, but uh, my apartment is actually quite near a, uh, uh, a train station. So like I said, that um, based on some of the pictures, but we also do this now um, digitally, but recording data in two and three dimensional space, we want to determine the scene's chronological history. And then we also want to interpret uh, the scene's chronological history within the context of the overall landscape. Did things move across the landscape? Uh, one of the things that we have problems in some of the mountain sites where um, remains of hikers may be found is that um, they may have died in one spot and the body um, as it decomposed and skeletonized, it may slide down uh, a slope through uh, colluvial action or action dealing with gravity. We also want to create a series of maps, section drawings, or looking at the soil profile and other imagery from the data recorded at the site. This is an example of some of the detail of the maps that uh, when I was working for the Department of Defense and, uh, and aspects of the maps that I want my students to uh, draw. And so this shows uh, several different layers of information. We understand the uh, distribution of material that's life support, which is material that's associated with the cockpit of an aircraft or a pilot's body. So clothing or specialized survival items, uh, material evidence, which is other kinds of evidence that might uh, indicate uh, things associated with the body of the pilot and then possible osseous or human remains, which are the red dots. And so, but you can see that the excavations that we're doing, we have a scale, we understand where we excavated, and we also have a very good uh, excavation of in the lower left hand is uh, some modern uh, graves, um, a uh, storage tank, and then several of these rice paddy fields. And so this is a very detailed map. And this is just an example of the kinds of work that we would do to put this archeological plane crash into a landscape uh, context. And this is just a more simple map that's from uh, a site in Europe. And so we have ME represents material evidence. The blue squares are possible human remains. The red squares are definite human remains. And then the green square is possible osseous remains, which is probably just uh, non-human animal bone. And then we have possible life support gear, the hashed uh, open squares that represent um, just, again, material that would have been associated with the pilot's body, like a life jacket or some kind of a harness or a seat belt, things like that. And again, another map that was in, in Belgium also that looks at the different area of excavation, the crater of the aircraft, areas that we found other evidence and then other indications of uh, different kinds of activities that occurred with searching. Each one of these transects represent a search zone in trying to find uh, other evidence related to this crash site. So you can see that the maps of the landscape are extremely detailed. And so this doesn't take that much more effort to do, but we are looking at large scale cold cases of aircraft crash sites in this sense. So again, getting back to achieving the goals of forensic archeology, span we wanna recognize any floral or plant life, faunal or animal or other topographic changes that have occurred on the landscape and how that affected the distribution of the evidence. We wanna recognize a criminal and non-criminal human interaction with the landscape. Did the criminals or uh, individuals or humans move material around the landscape or was it removed by non-criminal human or non-human activity was it we're referred to one of the classes I'm teaching right now with my students is looking at um, different modification of bones or other evidence uh, from from taphonomy forensic taphonomy and how it got modified and primarily we're looking at distribution and modification by uh, rodents as well as large and medium-sized carnivores um, we want to recognize the ex and excavate buried surfaces. So oftentimes we have we might have an old ground surface and it's been buried through flood. One of the recover 
serve physical and contextual evidence. And so in this sense with a crime scene activity, I think it's really important that we understand um, that objects are extremely important, but it's the context and how they're related to each other gives us most of the information about that we can use to interpret that. And that comes from this contextual evidence from the landscape and the excavation of the soil itself. So again, getting back to this um, recognizing clandestine activity. So how, what are some of the ways? So this is one of the ways that we were doing it, training uh, Nebraska law enforcement with the evidence uh, recovery unit and forensic unit for the Omaha Police Department. But we had these, um, these manufactured graves that they could see what material would look like. It was a very recent um, uh, burial. And so, but we also have uh, some of the aspects that are going on. So if somebody is buried in the ground, some of the things that we can find is that you have uh, what we call cohesive background material or the original sediment or soil, and then it's been cut and dug into. So it's much looser when a body's been put in there. And so you begin to see uh, what they call relic excavated material. That's dirt that didn't get put back into the grave. The ground's uneven. We have a consistent vegetation background, and then it's just completely disturbed, and then it continues on the other side. And so these are some of the things that we can begin to look at. But what happens in the, the drawing below that? So we begin to see a lot of other activities that are going on as the site ages and the body decomposes. So we begin to have a depression of the ground when the body cavity collapses. You still have this cohesive background uh, material. You still have loose material. But then we begin to see uh, consistent vegetation on either side and then different kind of very more, usually more vibrant vegetation because it's, it's growing because of the large number of organics that are associated with the decomposition. And the other thing that we have is um, associated relic um, leachate plume as the body decays. Um, those decomposition products um, go out of the, the individual grave cut. So this is a project that I'm working on uh, with the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, where I got my PhD. We're gonna be looking at um, how far from a grave is there a plume of DNA? How far outside the grave can we collect DNA from this, the decomposition products of this individual? So that's something that we'll be working on over the next year as a research project. So a key thing to remember is that when we're doing archaeology, it's destructive in nature. So we want to get those key lines of evidence or the spatial relationships between the items and the spatial relationships between the items of evidence and their environmental setting. These types of things can only be observed in, uh, in situ or in place at the time of excavation. It's not something that we can try to remember and recreate once we get back to the lab. It has to be recorded and documented at the time the, of the investigation itself. This has seemed pretty obvious, but a lot of times I've received a box of materials. There was no map, there's no photographs, and I've been asked to uh, do something with it. So the excavation team uh, that conducts the excavation, maybe the only people that ever see those relationships between these types of, of uh, evidence. So it's critical that the excavation team create these records that I've been talking about, photographic, mapping, um, digital records, they have to be of the highest standards. So the quality of the excavation is measured by the amount of information that's collected in addition to the items of evidence. So sometimes, uh, my colleagues are always talking about the number of items, but it's the quality of the amount of information, not just the objects themselves that are important. So we need to understand the context of how these things are related to each other and how they're related to the environment in which they were found. So when do we use forensic archaeologists? So potentially forensic archaeologists are useful at all crime scenes, uh, but they are most useful uh, or especially useful when the evidence is becoming beginning to become incorporated into the natural cultural environment or the outdoors. So as this material begins um, to degrade or become incorporated into the natural environment, uh, as opposed to the indoor environment, 
this is a time when forensic archaeologists uh, would be very extremely useful because they have the experience, the knowledge, uh, and the education to understand uh, that those types of processes. So uh, in summary, I wanted to say that forensic archaeology is a subset of forensic anthropology. So it's something that goes hand in hand like a marriage. So forensic archaeology attempts to recover evidence from the natural environment. And forensic archaeology, excuse me, attempts to understand how evidence has become incorporated into the natural environment. But forensic archaeologists also need lots of skills. And uh, because of this, we tend to be excellent coordinators of different activities. Again, all archaeology is destructive, and so we need to focus on the special relationships between items and how they're situated in the landscape. And this requires, as I said, uh, gave examples earlier, it requires meticulous reporting. So light crime scene investigation and documentation, this provides Forensic archaeology provides the foundation of evidence recovery and analysis. This is the foundation of all good forensic work. So we build on our laboratory analysis based on how things are recovered in the field and from a crime scene. So um, I will talk about um, this uh, World War II crash site in northern Washington state that we worked on. And I'm not sure because well, anyway, that's okay. So I'm gonna skip through these because this is some of the material that I already talked about. Um, uh, uh, so this uh, in between, sir. Uh, screen is not uh, fully visible to us. Not fully shared. It's, it's There's a far. green box in there somewhere. So I'm not sure what's going on with that. Just hold on a moment, please. Oh, I see what's going on. Let me unshare that. Yeah, now it's fine, sir. Okay. Okay, so th this was one of the things um, that maybe got glossed over in the biography, but for 21 years, I was the uh, assistant or the deputy laboratory director of the US uh, Department of Defense's Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency. It's a large uh, MIA, Missing in Action Personnel Recovery Effort for any military service members that went missing during uh, World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam conflict, and any subsequent uh, conflicts after that. It currently has about 400 military personnel that are specialists in mortuary affairs, uh, 300 civilian personnel, 60 forensic anthropologists, and four forensic odontologists. So it's one of the largest uh, skeletal identification laboratories in the world. And so I retired from this in 2019, and then I accepted a position at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Uh, but I still interface with them to do recoveries. We're actually going to uh, taking uh, 10 students to Assam, and we'll be excavating a B-26 uh, Super Fortress uh, crash site in, uh, with cooperation from the Anthropological Survey of India. Uh, this is just an example, or the, um, the one main building that's in Hawaii where I was working. And this area over here on the left upper part was my office and this third floor was the office space and the analytical space for the skeletal analysis. And the rest was, um, um, visiting tours, as well as our historical analysis and then our administration section. So the case background of this individual was on 28 November 1942, a pilot departed Elmendorf Field in Alaska in the U.S. He failed to arrive at his location, Payne Field in Idaho. Uh, he was last contacted about 100 miles east of the city of Bellingham in Washington State. So about 65 years later, two hikers came across the aircraft wreckage in the Poseidon Wilderness. And in 2002, they finally reported uh, this to the Department of Defense for investigation. And then in August of 2005, I led an archeological team to excavate the site where we had positive results and recovered the pilot's body. Um, it took them five years to report it because they were involved in illegal activities 
of modifying the environment and adding fish to a um, pristine area that they weren't allowed and they were using it for their own fishing preserve. But this was a wilderness zone in the US and that what they were doing was illegal. So they didn't report what they were finding uh, for about five years when they finally did. So this is the type of aircraft that we were looking for. It's a P-38 Lightning. So it's a very common aircraft. This is not the specific aircraft uh, that we found, um, but it, I mean, it's this type of aircraft, but this isn't the actual aircraft that we found. So uh, this is Washington State. And so this is the site or city of Bellingham that I spoke about. Some of you may know about Seattle. Um, and uh, Redmond, where Microsoft is made and all that stuff. But uh, this red star represents the location of the crash site. So it's very up, uh, far up in the map mountains of the North Cascades, but it's also near the border of Canada. This gives you another idea of the topographic landscape. This is the site. Um, this is a little lake here near the site. That's what we were, we were camping near there. And then we would walk to the site every day to, be, to do the excavations. And this is a Google map of the site. You know, so we had to walk from this lake all the way across this tailless slope and it's very steep terrain. Um, it's very beautiful up there. It's looked like many areas. I mean, to, to me, this looks also looked like the part portions of Northeastern India. And so, but this is uh, the view outside my tent looking out of the lake every morning until it snowed. It snowed in uh, August up in the mountains. So it was, uh, that was not fun. So this is a map of the actual excavation that we did. This is the tail boom. If you remember this, the airplane had two engines, sort of a cockpit pod, and then uh, two um, our booms that went out to a tail. And so this is one of those tail booms, fuel tank, the two engines, machine guns, and then several uh, other aspects of the propellers and things like that that were found. We positively identified the aircraft based on the serial number that was on the tail section. Actual air we're looking for. This shows the terrain, the uh, or skin or aircraft skin scattered over the landscape, as well as uh, some other aspects of, so there, it was pretty much torn apart when it hit, hit the ground. It's one of the machine guns that was, uh, the barrel was torn back. Um, this chamber has been opened because the hikers actually took all of the ammunition out of it and took it home. Um, that caused a serious problem because it was also incendiary rounds and high explosive rounds. It wasn't just normal 50 caliber ammunition bullets. It was uh, uh, pretty dangerous material. And so there was actually law enforcement raid on this individual's garage to uh, confiscate uh, these explosives. This is the tail boom. This is the supercharger here. Um, that is part of the engine compound or complex in there. And this is another area and, and most of this area down at the lower part where we found most of the remains was uh, heavily burned from the aircraft fuel. Uh, this is some other debris. This is actually a ham radio. So this is a shortwave radio that this uh, uh, the pilot had. And this is his personal equipment. This is part of the aircraft, this uh, um, generator. But this other material is um, and then a wrench, but this was busted apart by the hikers and trying to gain access and get control of their materials. This is the quick excavation area. We had to tie in with ropes for safety because it was so steep. Everything was screened. We excavated it down to the base sediment. Again, with the map I wanted to show. So this area has an archeological feature of a burial pit that's here. And this is what we recovered in the aircraft. So we didn't find all of the aircraft, um, but we did recover most of it or have pieces of most of it. So this is the areas that we excavated with the engines up here near the cockpit debris. 
And then down at the bottom, uh, where we had a break in slope where there was actually a burial feature here. So this is where we found all the bones, all the material of the individual was in layer three of this archeological feature, this burial pit. Just a quick um, summary of some of the archeological material that we found. His lap belt, it was latched so that we know that he didn't um, get out of the plane. Um, other kinds of strap adjusters and parts of uh, parachute. And then this is burned parachute silk. Uh, his 45 caliber uh, pistol um, still had bullets in this one, but these had gotten um, probably exploded during um, the fire. He found his identification tags. These are different scales, so I think this is a little misleading, but these are his identification tags. But this is uh, his rank insignia that would have gone on the collar. And so this is, uh, you know, one, two, and three centimeters in the same scale up here, but obviously these are different sizes. We found the bill of one of his, uh, his hat that he wore. So this part. And we also found a baggage compartment that had most of his personal effects in it. So that was located in here and that was the tail boom that we actually had evidence of. So we found his socks, not government issue socks. These are his personal socks. Uh, this was his uh, garment bag or his laundry bag made out of denim. His glasses. And he also had scratched his initials and name in his glass case, his fountain pen, also scratched his initials in there. I think he was afraid of losing something. So he wrote his initials on everything, which is good for us. A camera, obviously the, the film had been exposed to the elements. So we weren't able to get any imagery off that. It would have been nice if we could. That's the family or the uh, camera that it was uh, as it was pristine. Um, a shoe shine kit, a shoe shine brush, and then again the uh, boot polish. Um, his survival kit. So this is his first aid kit. There were other aspects here. This is fragments of a bottle that had iodine in it for treating water and then uh, fish hooks and fishing line for fishing as part of the survival kit. And that's the reconstructed radio that we found all the pieces of. I don't, I, I, to this day, I don't understand why they broke it up because it was relatively complete. And this is what it looked like um, from the photographs that we were able to identify the model and also um, comics. So I won't talk about the remains um, or show photographs of them out of respect for the individual and his family, but these uh, remains, they were um, heavily um, gnawed by large carnivores, probably bears, um, but they were also um, heavily gnawed by rodents, these uh, type of, but we have, so what? So anyway, so we have rodent nine and um, large carnivore. But what was going on with this burial feature? I found out later that um, bears will cache food, so they all actually dig pits and bury food in it for when they come out of hibernation. And so I suspect that that's what had happened here. This hole was actually dug by a large um, balu or bear and uh, the remains are buried in there. And then there were some nine of the bones and then later nine by rodents, but the bear never came back for this for whatever reason. So this is basically me talking about that. So we have um, the large um, black bear in the area. There's also grizzly bears, but I suspect it was this bear because it's more common in the region. And then uh, these uh, little things that are called pikas but they're little rodents that live in the rocks. Um, and they were very um, interesting to work or not work with, but try to get to sleep with because they were all over our tents and they would chirp all night long. And so, as well as uh, gnawing on bones. So. so in conclusion with this, it's like the public is essential in finding some of these very isolated sites, but they, the hikers also looted some of the items in the baggage compartment as well as armor piercing and incendiary 
50 caliber ammunition. But the recognition of these taphonomic processes related to the post-mortem modification of the remains by the large carnivores and the rodents uh, was important to understanding how the site transformed and how the ev evidence was modified. So this is a photograph of the pilot, uh, Kev uh, Kenneth Ambrose. This is actually the photograph taken uh, just as he left Alaska to fly on this mission before, and he, was, he never was found until about 65 years later. And so that's, that's all I have for that. So um, are there any questions about that? Maybe that rounded out some and uh, giving a good case study of some of the aspects that I was talking about. I realized it was relatively quick.